Hello everybody, ladies and gentlemen, you're watching Real Russia channel. My name is Sergei Baklikov and uh, now together with me here in the restaurants of Cosmos Hotel in Moscow, uh, Ronald, you already know him, and this is Vladislav Krasnov. He's the founder and the president of RAGA, Russian American Goodwill Association. And uh, this is uh, the man who known here in Russia for writing the book The New Russia from Communism to the... Uh, to New Russia. Well, this is uh, day 11 of uh, 23 days that me and Sergei will be working together here in Russia. This is my uh, first day uh, in Moscow and my first time ever in Moscow. Uh, I've, uh, I've been associated with uh, Vladislav uh, and his organization for about, uh, about a year and a half. I've, uh, I participated in uh, in some blogging in this forum. Uh, we've been trying to uh, recently. We've been, tr been trying to get a meeting together. Um, we haven't been able. Our our schedules haven't had, haven't mixed. We and, tried uh, it in the United States. Yeah, we did. We work? did. Uh, he was. Uh, we we're going to try to meet in D.C. Uh, he ended up having to go to San Francisco, and then I had to start this trip. And it just by coincidence, basically. It's a happy coincidence. Yeah, we ended up in Moscow at the same time. So. Um, anyway, uh, I'd like uh, I'd like you to go ahead and tell us a little bit about your history, uh, how you came to the United States first off, and uh, uh, then uh, tell us about uh, your organization, if you would. Yes, well, I, I am a naturalized American citizen. I've been living in the United States major part of my life, actually since 1966. Uh, but uh, even before, I defected from the former Soviet Union to Sweden, so where I got uh, the status of refugee, and uh, later on I was able to travel uh, to other countries of the world, including the United States, and eventually decided to settle in the United States. So I am bona fide American citizen, and also all my life was rather academic. I was professor at a number of American universities, and that's where, where I quit in 1991, 92, when the Soviet Union fell apart. I quit my academic job. <laughs> with my uh, uh, Monterey Institute of International Studies, where I was the head of the Russian program, and started uh, doing my own business. I moved from California to Washington, D.C., and set up a business for uh, translation and interpretation. And it soon became apparent that there are still great cultural differences between the new Russia, which emerged after the end of the Soviet Union and the United States. In other words, there was still a lot of cultural misunderstanding. So even though people were free to travel and to understand each other, and even when you had good translators and interpreters, still the cultural disparity was so great, so there was necessity to mediate. And I felt that because I belong to both cultures, I could be a good mediator, kind of intercultural communications consultant. And also, at about the same time, all the network of Soviet, former Soviet societies of friendship, which they had literally with all countries of the world, society of friendship, the USSR France, USSR Sweden, USSR Japan, and of course USSR USA, they all disintegrated in 91. There was nothing left. And that's why I felt that there was a vacuum which needs to be filled. So that's why I found this at my own expense, the Russia-America Goodwill Association. Association of people who do not have any political agenda except desire for the two nations, two great cultures to understand each other. So all you need for that is goodwill. So I think my organization is non-political because we do not project ourselves as uh, Republicans or uh, Democrats even though some of our members, some readers may have whatever opinions. The main thing that they have a desire to find out what Russia is all about. And now, at least since 91, opportunities are plenty. You can visit Russia anytime and see uh, Russia for, with your own eyes and decide what to think about it. And yeah, that's, uh, that's something that I think uh, a problem that a lot of Americans have is that they have really no idea of what Russia is. They, they think of Russia as uh, being uh, uh, similar to the, what it was like during 
maybe the, the, the days of Khrushchev or even Stalin and a kind of a gloomy gray place where people slave away in factories all day and uh, it's really not. I, I, you'd, you'd be amazed to see how much uh, uh, really, I, I think there's a lot of dynamism here now uh, since, since uh, Russia has adopted a, uh, a market economy, and you can see uh, uh, you can see it all over the place in, in, in terms of uh, retail, uh, a lot of American brands, and uh, a lot of American media, uh, even on Russian television, um, and of course in the uh, in the in the cinemas as well. And uh, I think I think uh, uh, I personally think that. The average Russian uh, understands uh, American culture um, much more than the average American yeah. understands Russian culture. And uh, his organization is, I think, at least attempting to, to bridge that gap and, and, and create more understanding and, and hopefully help to eliminate the hostilities that I, I personally believe are, are brought about by uh, propaganda from my own government. I, I personally believe that. And media. No, well, yes, <laughs> of course, there uh, has been changes now, both in uh, yeah. the former Soviet Union, Russia, right. Right. it's a new political entity, yeah. and the United States have been evolved in two. And, and those trends are not always what we think they are. Right. It seems like in the United States there is greater concentration of power, while Russia, even though it is still being essentially country center on Moscow and the central government, right. nonetheless, there's considerable uh, room for different opinions. Uh, and for me, it is very important because as a former Soviet dissident, I value the freedom of expression and freedom of communication and freedom of dialogue yeah. on whatever topic with anyone. So and that has been shrinking in the United States, seems to me, while it has been increasing in Russia. Especially in the last year. Uh, yes, yeah. Yeah, I agree with you. Uh, yeah. Uh, last year, because under, under uh, yeah, well, the, the increasing uh, increasing uh, scapegoating of Russia, this whole Russian collusion myth uh, with the Trump election, and uh, in addition to that, uh, the uh, this whole idea that that Russia somehow intentionally uh, influenced the election and and that's what caused Trump to win, you know, and, and this this sort of thing is coming actually from both parties, which is really surprising. Even the uh, the neocons in the Republican Party are also uh, uh, adopting the same attitude and saying the same things that Russia somehow uh, 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 influenced the election. They're trying to uh, destroy the American democracy for whatever reason. And, and they're, it just, uh, it's, it's an agenda to, to vilify Russia and, and also to make a, a, a villain out of, of Vladimir Putin. Uh, yes, it is. Uh, <laughs> it's against uh, Putin and it's and a, it's Putin's a pattern. Phobia. It's a pattern yeah. that we've seen before, right? Yes. Uh, with with uh, with other countries. I mean, you have, first off, you have to vilify the the leader. You have to you have to uh, malign uh, like Saddam Hussein. Like, exactly, you know, exactly. All of a sudden, or, they came to call him Hitler, a new Hitler, Saddam right. Hussein. Right, with right. When nuclear weapons. And when the, during the uh, war with Iran, yeah. he was our ally. Yes, and, right. You know, and, he was. Yeah, and and the uh, and the only wep uh, chemical weapons he ever had were chemical weapons that the United States supplied to him. Yes, yeah. During during the uh, Iran Iraq war. So it just uh, it's a, it's a it's a bad trend because uh, unlike Iraq, unlike Libya, unlike Syria, unlike Egypt, uh, unlike Yemen, unlike many other third world countries that the United States has been engaging in this sort of uh, uh, regime regime change with um, Russia has something that's significantly different from the rest of them, that's a large nuclear arsenal. <laughs> yes, and it was entirely needless, I think. Yeah. After 1991, there was need, no need to uh, retain NATO, and much less to expand it. No, and even, even Trump said that during the campaign, remember? Uh, he, well, he, he, said, he said NATO may lo no longer be necessary, and of course he got he got ridiculed for it, and he had to back he had to back pedal. Because it. NATO was created in order to counteract the growing influence of the Soviet Union and the Soviet bloc. Right. Once the Soviet Union was gone, the Soviet bloc was gone. Right. There was no need for that. Right. And actually, it is uh, in agreement with the strategy of George Kennan, the man who actually created U.S. strategy how to contain the Soviet Union. Right. And I met him and I heard him speaking at the Hoover Institution one of the very few anti-communist think tanks in the United States. Yeah. He was saying, uh, once uh, communist is gone, so let Russians 
figure out the way they want to live. Yeah? It's a sovereign country, let them be Russians, don't try to meddle. And so we seem to be fighting against our own success. Uh, our success maybe made many Americans maybe too proud. Yeah? And so that's a hubris, that's a Greek expression, which means that they became elevated in their pride that they can do anything and they the can American exceptionalism exceptionalism the and they can yeah. humiliate yeah. their former opponent which was already down and right. and begging for assistance and now he was being humiliated by the United States so that was unneeded interference in Russian affairs and so that continued uh, virtually until uh, uh, throughout the uh, uh, Yeltsin era because the United States at that time actively meddled in the process of privatization. They, to a large extent, helped to create the oligarch system in Russia. And then uh, only the first time I heard real assertion of uh, Russian sovereignty, it was uh, when uh, former Prime Minister Evgeny Primakov was about to visit the United States in, I think it was uh, 1998, and he was uh, already flying on the airplane for state visit. Prime Minister uh, under President Yeltsin one was about to meet with the American officials to, to improve the uh, relation between the USA and, and Russia. And then he turned his plane around. Why? Because at that time the United States started bombing of Yugoslavia. And so that was such a drastic action so I think it was the time to do something about that. The United States on a, on a very crazy way to, to meddle in affairs. We, we have no idea what it might lead to. So uh, actually I had a stake on that as a, as a raga. Uh, I just managed to publish in the main newspaper in Washington, the Washington Post, an advertisement yeah, for the, the Prime Minister Evgeny Primakov Welcome to the United States, etc. Actually, I purchased a place for advertisement, and then we turn around. Then I called people who read the Washington, uh, time, please, uh, Washington Post, please come to have a forum to discuss what happened. And indeed, many people came, and we decided that uh, that uh, U.S. policy is completely wrong and counterproductive to American national interests. So I think my raga. Uh, association, Russia, America, Goodwill Association, yeah, we stand for protection of U.S. national security interest, national interest. And the best way to secure uh, the interest of the United States, national interest of the United States, the best way uh, is to, to be friends with Russia. It does not mean that you have to be in love and to hug each other, but at least to have correct relations, respectful for a difference. And it's, for me, it's important because I lived in the Soviet Union. It was a totalitarian society. They tolerated no difference. It was very monologic. Yeah? There was no dialogue. So the United States should not go that way of monologic Absolutely. dictation. <laughs> <Yeah>. So um, uh, what do you think about the uh, situation in uh, Donbass? Any, uh, uh, Sergey and I recently visited uh, Donetsk. Um, do you have anything to say about that? Well, I have never been in that part of uh, Ukraine. I had visited Ukraine. Actually, uh, I used to work as a, a contract interpreter for U.S. Department of State. And then, uh, I think, 1995, I visited Ukraine uh, as interpreter for that group. It was concerning security of uh, Ukraine's nuclear station after Chernobyl disaster. So, and even before that, in the Soviet time, because I was uh, ethnologist, or some people say anthropologist, did the research in many parts of the former Soviet Union, in, uh, uh, in the Academy of Sciences of the former Soviet Union. So I had some familiarity with the uh, ethnic situation in Ukraine as well as in Belarus and I traveled in other parts. I actually spent some time in Crimea. In Crimea I was uh, taking part in archaeological expedition. She was digging soil of Crimea to discover some ancient Greek cities and artifacts. So one might say that I dug 
Russian soil more in Crimea than anywhere else. <laughs> so because they worked as a laborer in the archaeological expedition. So um, of course Crimea is close to my heart, and I visited before in 1914 the Crimea. I knew the situation there was uneasy and not uh, good for either ethnic Russians there nor Ukrainians. It was like no man's land without special development. So um, I welcomed the decision of the Ukrainian of the people of the Crimea during the referendum that they decided to join the Russian Federation. I think it was wise. I know it's a uh, difficult question for the uh, territorial integrity of Ukraine, but then again it happens in many other regions of the world. The best example for the United States is our neighbor, Canada. So just, uh, I think also in the early 90s, there was a, a very, uh, very acute situation about Quebec, which was French-speaking. The rest of Canada is English-speaking. And still they found a compromise. So it is impossible, it is, it is possible, and it's desirable to always look for a compromise. Or take Switzerland, one of the best democracies in Central Europe. So they also have compromise. You can, different languages, agree in the same country. And so I think they co can coexist in Ukraine too. So if Ukrainians insist on the in integrity, including um, the Donbass, they should allow not to be uptight. Let the people speak whatever language they like and advance their own culture. Especially because the Ukrainian and the Russian culture is considerably closer to each other than, let's say, the Anglophiles in Canada or Francophiles in Canada. So that's a kind of given. They should be friends. Yeah, Sergey and I uh, recently uh, visited Crimea. We spent uh, several days in uh, Sudak. It's a little uh, uh, town on the uh, Black Sea coast. It's a kind of a resort town. Uh, Sergey's going to also post some videos on that. Um, yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, isn't it true that uh, that Crimea uh, historically was uh, was part of Russia and was only uh, made uh, part of um, the Ukraine uh, during uh, uh, what the 50s? Uh, well, yes, Ukraine did not exist as independent state right. after, until that name certainly. Right. So there was part was common history mm -hmm. beginning from the 10th century when right. Russia adopted Christianity. Right. And so that was at that time the the center of political activity was Kiev. Mm -hmm. So that at that time they called it Kievan Rus. Mm -hmm. Kievan Rus. Mm -hmm. But they included many northern cities. Moscow did not exist yet, but of course there were other like Novgorod city, uh, Rostov and other. So they were still part of the same cultural entity, even though the princes often quarreled with each other, nonetheless they felt the commonality of their um, uh, culture and religion after adopting Christianity and it was orthodox variety from Byzantine. There was a certainly a great unity from the, uh, from the north, from the Baltic Sea to the Black Sea. It was all uh, one single community of people speaking the same language and, uh, and uh, believing in the same religion. Mm -hmm. so, and then later on, uh, especially after the Mongol invasion in the, uh, in the beginning of 13th century, so the Russia was split apart because part were occupied by the Mongols and, uh, and uh, later part of uh, Russia, which is now Ukraine, were under the dominance of the Tatars, mm -hmm. who were also part of the greater Mongol Empire, mm -hmm. and of course they were dominant uh, in the steppes of Ukraine. And the steppes of Ukraine, what is we call Ukraine, the Russians call it Mother Russia, Little Russia. Mm -hmm. They were very dangerous for Russia because the, the Tartar or Mong Mongol cavalry from the south could attack any time the main northern cities of Russia. So it was a necessity to, uh, to form uh, fortresses along the border and or to try to make the territory, which is called now Ukraine, to, to make it friendly to, to Russians. Mm -hmm. There was a necessity for both people, for both whom we call Ukrainians and the Russians, to be friends. There is no escape from that. 
So, um, so I, I guess the point is is that the borders have been flexible over time, and uh, and and the way I see it is uh, is the so-called annexation of uh, of Crimea wasn't really an annexation, but a reunification, especially considering that that. A majority of the people living in Crimea are what? They're Russians, right? They're more they're more tied culturally right. with right. Russia. So it's it's more of a of a of a right to self determination thing. Yes, I think it's the right term. It right. Was, uh, right. Reunification. Right. Russia. There was definitely a reunification. Especially because uh, Crimea has a kind of uh, autonomous, at least on paper, mm -hmm. entity of the former Soviet Union was uh, uh, given to the Ukrainians under Nikita Khrushchev, right. who himself was of Ukrainian background. Right. So not that uh, it, uh, it mattered. At that, might, at that time, it did not really matter to whom it belonged, because it belonged to the central government. Right. Could, uh, but formally, uh, Khrushchev made Crimea part of Ukraine. Right. It was uh, a move which was unnecessary and which became uh, the reason for the later quarrels. Right. And, uh, and the territory of Crimea was uh, incorporated as part of Russia at the time of Catherine the Great. Essentially, it has been part of Russia as long as the United States exists. So it is integral part of Russia. And uh, there are many Ukrainians too, uh, but the majority of people are uh, Russians. And there are also many Tartars, and many Karaims, uh, many Greeks. It's very mixed population, but the majority of people and the dominant part and the dominant cultural entity of Crimea is Russian. And I'm delighted that they voted through a referendum. And the referendum took place uh, on the 16th of March uh, 2014. And it was incidentally, it was just coincidence, but I see it uh, was probably providential uh, coincidence. It was exactly 97 years after Grand Duke Michael Romanov signed the Manifesto of Abdication and transferring power of the future of Russia to the Russian people to decide the form of government through a general election uh, in referendum. So referendum was accomplishment of that uh, dream of that manifesto that Russia should have the right to vote and decide their place through equal vote for all. Now the uh, the uh, situation in the uh, Lugansk uh, People's Republic and the uh, Donetsk uh, People's Republic is uh, maybe a little bit more complicated. Uh, what, what do you think about that situation? I well, because they are not uh, isolated, so to speak. Exactly. The Crimea, it's still, uh, you have to move there. Well, that's why they're building bridge now. Right, right. There's a right. little uh, isthmus there. Yeah, there's not the a geographical path. separation. Not, right. Yeah. So, but, but again, historically, it also has been very much integrated with the rest of Russia, more than the rest of Ukraine. So it's, uh, uh, and even the uh, main part of Ukraine, where Kiev and around, it is also uh, divided by culturally uh, uh, Russians who may not be, who may have Ukrainian blood, but they speak Russian language. And only the western part of Ukraine has more uh, rights for separation, for, for uh, independent cultural existence. I do not favor that. I, I am not against Ukrainian integrity perhaps even including Donbass, but on the condition that the people get uh, treatment as citizens of a, a great country. And there is uh, no reason for the Russians or Ukrainians of Donbass to quarrel with each other. So if you take the United Kingdom, there's great cultural difference between the Scots uh, and the Brits. Uh, and, and there were so many wars, bloody wars between the two different people. But those people belong to different language groups. They do not have common language. And yet, sometimes the Scots were the best uh, soldiers of the British army. So there is no, they managed to overcome the cultural difference which existed before. And I think uh, that's a good example for the Russians, Ukrainians, 
to follow the example of the United Kingdom, where people can coexist, and of course there are ten tensions and um, divisions even there. We take example of Northern Ireland, so it's more complicated. But if we in the West have the patience with Northern Ireland, don't we have patience? Very patiently, we're working yeah, yeah, out. Yeah, yeah. The United States is trying to help both parts, mm -hmm. and many. The people from Ireland doing very well in the United States. Mm -hmm. Actually, the St. Patrick's Day is more celebrated in the United States than in Northern Ireland or right. Ireland as such. Right. So the United States could be mediator instead of trying to drive a wedge between the Ukrainians and Russians in Donbass. No, they've, well, the United States has clearly taken a side. Um, there's actually clear evidence that, that the United States uh, sponsored the Maidan and the subsequent civil war that erupted between the two sides, uh, between the, the LNR, DNR, and Ukraine. Um, and recently, there's been the, uh, the additional, uh, uh, additional um, um, addition of uh, modern weapons, uh, anti-tank weapons, uh, missiles that, that have been supplied, not uh, cl under clandestine way, but actually above the board now. So the United States uh, military is now officially supporting the uh, Ukrainian government effort yeah. to, uh, to, I guess, to what, to reuni reunify LNR, DNR with yes. this? Ronald, I can, could not agree more with you, because the situation in both Crimea and Donbass mm -hmm. uh, occurred precisely because there was some uh, dishonest play in Kiev. Mm -hmm. with all that mind down situation right. when actually uh, a compromise was about to be worked out between Yanukovych and those people who were heading the Maidan. But then through United States interference, that collaboration or attempts to figure out a compromise were undermined. And so actually there was a meeting there when uh, the foreign minister of France uh, and Germany and Poland sign an agreement. There will be a compromise agreement with Yanukovych. And yet, in a couple of days, after that fatal and mysterious shooting, when many people were killed by snipers, presumably directed by some terrorists, but certainly not from Yanukovych's side, because it was not to Yanukovych's advantage to stir the trouble. After that, the government collapsed, and so it was essentially coup d'etat. And the way the current government of Ukraine came to power was so obviously illegal. So that gave the reason for the people of Crimea and the people of Donbass and other parts of Ukraine to be very aware, very uh, cautious and, and very disturbed by the situation in the capital city of Kiev. So would you say that the United States interfered with the internal politics of a sovereign nation? That seems to be. With that regards to, to Ukraine? Uh, yeah. Yes. And, and, and hasn't, it been, uh, hasn't there been an awful lot of criticism against uh, uh, Russia supposedly doing the same thing in the United States? Vis-a-vis -vis the, ele the, the recent election, well, <laughs> presidential election? <laughs> well. <laughs> I mean, I just, I just find it, yeah. I, I find it laughable, you know, yeah, well, when, when, it, when, when, uh, when the Russians, the Russians, yeah. right, who, who knows who they were, whether it was directed from the Kremlin or whether it was just uh, uh, some independent Russians spent $120,000 on Facebook ads versus the United States spent, what, $5 billion uh, in the intervention in Ukraine. So it, it's kind of, again, it's, it's the, what you're talking about, the hubris you're talking well, about before. Yes, I yeah. myself not so advanced in the inter in internet, and the mm -hmm. new technologies, but I think the new technologies do come in play. And so now opportunity to manipulate the public opinion, either in the United States or in, in Europe or throughout the world, so great. Mm -hmm. So it is kind of scary. Right. And it's a huge concentration of power in the very few mega media corporations. So right. just uh, 20 years ago, there were probably 50 of them in the United States, and they spoke in distinctly different voices. Sometimes coincided at some point, sometimes not. So there was diversity. But then, 20 years passed, now there are only five corporations, and they have the real power, which probably exceeds the three powers which we formally uh, 
regulates through the division of power, executive, uh, legislative, and judicial. So the three branches of government, the United States recommended to Russia, and Russia did follow that uh, recommendation, trying to have the same in the new Russia under Yeltsin. But meanwhile, they did not see how the United States, the fourth power, the power of manipulating and creating public opinion, and essentially manipulating, became stronger than the three branches of government. Mm -hmm. And so that's why our minds are so influenced. So that's why I think organizations like my organization, Raga, Raga.org, Russia, America, Goodwill Association, have a role to play because we withstand the tendency of, in the United States for the huge uh, manipulative corporations uh, to take over and to dictate whatever they want to, including to executive power, as they do now, obviously, on, in respect to President uh, Trump. So going forward, no. <laughs> any, any predictions of the future? <laughs> <laughs> any predictions of the yeah. future? That, well, I, I do consider my organization and it uh, has been in existence since 92, uh, so more than 25 years. And I think we are still needed, we are doing well, we get a lot of response from Americans. I want them to write, to write, uh, to participate in our forum, to express their opinion and uh, to make their mark. So even small companies like that can still carry a lot of weight because the word of truth nah, is uh, most of the time is uh, more impressive than tons of lies. So I think we, we hold our ground and we hope other people will join us and do the same and to express their opinion. Again, we are not political in the sense, we are not Republican, we are not Democrat, we are not rightist, we are not leftist, though we favor, nah, so people can write to us from a leftist viewpoint, nah, from the rightist viewpoint, nah, whatever from a nationalist point of view, uh, as long as they respect uh, my, uh, right, the right of others to disagree and do not attack uh, 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 in obscenities uh, either U.S. government or Russian government, uh, we should respect uh, uh, with whom we talk, including the governments. So that's why uh, when uh, uh, President Putin, uh, I'm sorry, uh, let me start with uh, Trump, when he was elected, I sent I send, uh, almost monthly newsletters, uh, I call it Russia uh, or Raga Antidotes, Russia anti, uh, Raga Antidote Letters, because essentially I, I think the country needs antidote, because the country is uh, now affected by the virus, uh, hate, hatred, and we need antidotes, sober, reasonable arguments. So I published those newsletters, and I, <coughs> when the, uh, President Trump was elected, I congratulated him. Uh, when recently President uh, Putin was re-elected, I congratulated him too. So that's only a question of, uh, uh, of civility uh, and uh, dialogue. And so let them figure out uh, the best way to how to organize their mutual relationship uh, on a civilized way. So, and it's cons I, I do, do say exactly the same to the Russians, and I happen to spend most of my time now in Russia, particularly in Moscow, but I also regularly in the United States, and I tell the same to Americans. No? So, mind your own business, and let Russians mind your own business. And as I mentioned before, I used to work as a, a contract, in contract interpreter for the U.S. Department of State, so uh, almost... Uh, 12 years, from uh, about uh, 1994 uh, till uh, 2008, and I visit all 50 states of the United States. I received an interpreter from many delegations, from Georgia, and I also visited Georgia, and uh, from Tajikistan, Kazakhstan. There was a delegation from Donbass, there was a, a Belarusians, and I see they have aspired for their own national identity, I respect it, uh, the United States have their own identity, and they received, uh, came to the United States and learned various subjects, uh, um, what 
what the United States could offer. Uh, it could be a fight against uh, AIDS, uh, or uh, the uh, dental care in the United States, or the work as the fire departments, or uh, dental care in the United States, various topics. Uh, and everywhere, uh, the American side were very hospitable, and the people, whether they came from Kazakhstan or Tajikistan or from Russia, were always appreciative of what the United States could offer. But if you do not impose it, it's just fine. If we can do best when we offer people to choose. But as soon as you start imposing, uh, you'll get negative reaction. Well, thanks very much. It's okay, great. We're so friend. glad we yeah. had a chance to meet <laughs> each other like this. <laughs> All right. Well, it's the uh, first time we uh, saw you. We like to mention that we first time talking. I want to yeah. shake your hand too. <laughs> Actually, uh, what I understand is that uh, you're making a kind of job that I do was in your fields. Well. We have like different fields, uh, but uh, we do the thing, the same thing. Yeah. And uh, uh, yeah, it, it's really great to meet you. You're making this job already for 25 years. I mean, uh, goodwill of the Russian American um, goodwill association. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> And I'm making this with the real Russia. And actually, it's not a coincidence that we have met, because uh, if we are making the same thing, so we had to meet, actually. Yes, I already told you that you are a good example of a new kind of Russian, not the ones uh, they denounce now in the United States. Presumably, the Russians continue the old Soviet traditions. No, you are an example of young men, well-educated, versed in English, both in global politics and doing good, not only for Russia, but also for the United States. When they hear you, they know that uh, it's a new Russia. Well, I do my best with a no fake and no BS. Now, Sergey, uh, he gave you a little gift, didn't he? <laughs> Why don't you show him the gift? Yes. Oh. This is a gift. This is uh, the book of Vladislav Krasnov. It is called New Russia from communism to national resurrection. Yes, but let me give it a page now, because then people can see and relate better when they see it in English. So let me show the title, it's quickly. Yeah. So well, like this book is it. available in English, Russia Beyond Communism, a Chronicle of National Rebirth. And it was published before the fall of the Soviet Union. So mm -hmm. it is a kind of program for Russian independence on the basis of their ancient traditions, including Russian Christianity. Mm -hmm. Hope you enjoyed an interview. Leave your comments, comments, like, and what? Subscribe. <laughs> <laughs> okay, see you guys.